So hello and welcome. I'd like to um, introduce myself. I'm Evelyn Blank. I am the Associate Executive Director of New York Center for Child Development and the Director of the New York City Early Childhood Mental Health Training and Technical Assistance Center. So welcome today to part one of a two-part professional education set of symposia, attachment, critical concepts, significant research, implications for intervention. And I'm really thrilled to say that we're gonna be joined for these two webinars by two national experts, Dr. Judith Solomon and Dr. Arietta Slade. And we're joined today by Dr. Judith Solomon and she will do part one, introduction to attachment concepts and research. So before we get started, I just wanted to go through a few logistics. Um, first of all, as we've done in the past, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted along with the slides on the TTAC website. And we'll give you that link in a few minutes. We'll also be taking questions throughout the webinar and we ask that you chat your questions into the chat box functionality, selecting all panelists on the dropdown. We'll set time aside at the end to really try and address all these questions. And finally, at the end of the webinar, we'll be sending out the Facebook survey, the feedback survey using the chat box functionality. We ask that you click on the link that is shared in the chat box and complete the feedback survey. And we really appreciate your feedback. We use this to really help guide our future trainings and offerings. So just a little brief word about who we are. Um, New York, the New York City Early Childhood Mental Health Training and Technical Assistance Center, otherwise known as TTAC, is funded through Thrive New York City, and it's in partnership with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, otherwise known as DOHMH. TTAC is a partnership between the New York Center for Child Development, NYCCD, and the McSilver Institute on Poverty Policy and Research. New York Center for Child Development has been a major provider of early childhood mental health services in New York with expertise in informing policy, but also supporting the field of early childhood mental health through both training and direct practice. Our partner is NYU McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research and they house the Community and the Managed Care Technical Assistance Centers, otherwise known as CTAC and MTAC. And each of these, uh, they offer clinic, business, and system transformation support statewide to all behavioral health providers. TTAC is tasked with building the capacity and competencies of mental health and early childhood professionals through ongoing training and technical assistance. And just a quick shot here of our website, which we encourage everybody to go. Um, if you go to the website, you can go to our archived webinars, you can find other resources and also learn about upcoming events. So it's now my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Gil Foley, who will introduce today's speaker. He is the clinical co-director of TTAC. Thank you, Evelyn and welcome colleagues. It is truly a distinct honor to introduce Dr. Judith Solomon and Tripa True. Uh, she needs no introduction. She's a key figure in the development of, of attachment figure. Dr. Solomon is a psychologist, both a researcher and a clinician. And she is the co-discoverer with Mary Main of disorganized attachment. She's a Fulbright Scholar and the 2018 recipient of the John Bowlby Award in London for significant contributions to the development of attachment theory. I've always said to my students, the best way to get knowledge is from the source. And Dr. Solomon is the source. And I turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, and here we go. This is going to be um, a pretty basic lecture on attachment so that everyone listening uh, is clear on some of the important concepts um, in attachment. We all share those definitions. So I'll be talking about that. I'll be giving you some, a summary of the best established research in this area. And then um, time permitting, we'll talk about some more applied aspects of attachment theory. So as you may know, uh, interest uh, in the early parent-baby relationship goes farther back than Freud, but he is well known for saying that the relationship the baby has with its mother is unique without parallel, established unalterably for a whole lifetime as the first and strongest love object and as the prototype of all later love relations. And we'll be considering whether this is true or false as we go along. 
Um, I wanted to say, by the way, that I will be saying mothering baby most often because most of the work on attachment and most of the research concerns mothers. But I want you to be clear that there is nothing that a mother can, um, that a mother does with her baby that a father doesn't do just as well. So I'm just uh, sticking with tradition, but men out there, please do not be offended. Um, we are going to look at a little video in a moment. Infant parent attachment has roots in ancient biological systems that we share with other birds and mammals, particularly apes and monkeys. Uh, and you can see it most clearly when we look at other species. So here's another species. He's pretending he doesn't see these ducks anymore. And she's turning away from him. We'll be talking about all these behaviors. <laughs> He's hoping she doesn't notice him. He's making himself very small. She wants to get him, but she's a little nervous. Come on, mom. This real life drama tells us very important things about the origins of attachment and I'm missing a slide. So what is attachment? It is a biologically based system of behavior evolved for the protection of the young. It is marked by the young showing preference for one or a few caregivers, for searching for that figure when they're separated and for staying close when they're distressed. And you saw all those little baby ducks do that um, and you saw how protective the mother was despite her nervousness. Another way of thinking about attachment at a higher level is that it is an enduring bond with specific individuals who are havens of safety and secure bases for the infant, child, or adult. Attachment is not everything, although sometimes people talk about it as if it's the whole of the parent-child relationship. But attachment is not the same as love. You can love without being attached, and you can be attached with very little love. It's also not the same thing as attunement, which we think of uh, something parents should be. It is not the same thing as reflective process. And it is not the same thing as affect regulation. Um, if these words are familiar to you, wonderful. If they're not, you don't have to pay any attention. Uh, attachment theory begins with John Bowlby. He was a psychiatrist in England, and he was very concerned with the effects of maternal loss. Um, probably harking back to his own er early childhood, people say, when he lost his very favorite nanny in England. The other names you see there are other important people, but we're gonna hurry along. It was John Bowlby who put together psychoanalysis, object relations theory, and the study of animals called ethology to come up with what we consider attachment theory now. This little graph shows you how Bowlby conceived of the organization of attachment. So attachment is organized around the goal of physical proximity, closeness to the caregiver. 
you can see that physical contact is what he thought of as the goal. You know this, when babies are really upset, only physical contact with their main caregiver will soothe them. When they're upset, they show a variety of behaviors. I have attachment behaviors here on the right side of the slide. Calling, smiling, crying, following, hands up. For babies who are disabled, they can crawl, they can roll, they can yell, whatever it is that calls the attachment figure to them or brings them to the attachment figure. On the left side of this little figure, you will see the kinds of events that activate, that turn on attachment behavior. So feeling vulnerable, including feeling sick, being in the presence of danger or feeling that danger is threatened. And that includes being in a darkened room at an unfamiliar place. And finally, if the attachment figure is not available. When she is available, everything calms down. But if the baby sees the attachment figure is looking elsewhere or moving away or cannot be seen at all, that's when we see attachment behavior. Just to be clear, the attachment system is not fully organized until the end of the first year of life. So we do not consider um, that there is really a consolidated attachment system. This graph says seven plus months, really in the last quarter of the first year is when you begin to say, see organized attachment behavior. Um, this is a good figure for you to know about. Um, how do you know that a child is attached to its caregiver? Well, they go to this figure, but they don't go to most others for consolation and protection. They look for this figure during separation they're soothed by contact and proximity, and they clearly enjoy interaction with this person over a stranger. For those of you who do evaluations of babies, it's very important to keep these, um, these items in mind. This is what you're looking for very often when you're trying to learn something about a baby's attachment to a parent figure. This is a picture of Mary Ainsworth Mary Ainsworth was a colleague of John Bowlby's and she developed the concepts of attachment security and maternal sensitivity that we'll be talking a lot about. And she also developed what's known as the strange situation and a classification system for types of attachment relationships. Now I'm gonna be talking about these types but before we get into that, I wanna make a few things clear. Um, people are not types. Relationships are not types. It's a convenience in our speech, but really the most important aspects of security and insecurity vary along a continuum. They're different at different times. We cannot place any particular child in a box for all time. But these are the continua that we think about when we think about individual differences in the security of a baby's attachment to parent. So there's secure and very insecure. Relationships can be organized or disorganized. And then of course, some babies have very little separation distress and some babies have a lot. And you can mix all of these dimensions and you can learn a lot about a mother baby relationship as long as we remember that despite my kind of way of speaking we're never talking about uh, we're never talking about a baby or a mother being a type now when we think about attachment it's important to remember that it exists in balance with other motivational systems especially um, mary Ainsworth and bowlby focused on um, the fact that attachment exists in balance with the motive to explore and learning about the environment. And this becomes a big piece of how the strange situation was designed. But while we're talking about this, attachment is going to be most visi visible in stressful circumstances 
and may be very subtle and may be easily confused with other behavior when the baby is not in a stressful circumstance. So that's another thing that's very important when you're making an assessment of a baby or a relationship. But it, for, the, for the strange situation and for Mary Ainsworth's purposes, it means that she needed to develop a situation where there was at least moderate stress and that is the well-known strange situation. You don't have to bother with all these different uh, episodes. There are eight episodes. There are uh, three minutes each. The important thing is that there is increasing stress on mother and baby, starting with when they be enter the playroom, which should be completely unfamiliar to the baby, and going all the way through two separations from the mother and two reunions. And babies are classified by looking at their behavior across all the episodes. So you were looking for patterns. And here is one of the world's best little babies. I'm going to show you how he reacts to what is moderate stress. Um, you'll see a little bit of his response to the first separation and how he reacts to his mother's return. And that um, that is the most important aspect of, as we say, looking at different individual differences among baby parent relationships, especially looking at how the child deals with reunion with the parent is most important for determining security. Here we go. He's with us now. So this is the first step. And here's mommy. He's clearly excited. Nothing stops him. He takes her. Hold on. So he's got his proximity, and at this point, that's all he needs. Seems to be fine. He just wants to check in with mom, show her something. And now he's going to be fine for the, for the rest of the three minutes. Uh, if I had time to show you all the other episodes, what you'd see is that when mom leaves now for what will be the second time, he is, um, he's okay at first, and then he gets that she's not in the room and he gets upset. And the first thing uh, we do to this baby, which is not very nice, is rather than send in the mother, the, the playmate who you saw to begin with goes in first to see if she can soothe him which she cannot. For a baby that is secure with the parent, they know perfectly well that that stranger is not their primary attachment figure. So he continues to be upset until his mother returns. Um, and in this time, which I'm not showing you, it takes him much longer. It takes him mm, probably a minute and a half to calm down and be ready even to look around the room with mother's um, supervision. So I've used some terms and not defined them. Uh, so let me do that now. Caregiver sensitivity is a primary concept in attachment. It, it, it is what lies behind most of the individual differences in mother-baby relationships. And this was Mary Ainsworth's concept. It, it is defined mainly by how promptly and appropriately the mother responds to the infant's attachment cues, the crying, the calling, the arms up, showing that he wants and needs her. But it is also associated with the extent to which she accepts or rejects him, the extent to which she makes herself available or unavailable, and how cooperative she is as opposed to intrusive she is when working with the baby. Out of this sensitivity comes what we call baby security, infant security. And that is what the child shows us in terms of his or her confidence 
that his caregiver will be responsive and available. So its security is based on previous experience. Um, and now I'm going to show you the, the quite famous attachment classification categories that Ainsworth came up with to uh, categorize uh, baby mother attachment relationships. The little boy you just saw named Marcus um, was a very secure baby. Um, between 50 and 70% of babies and children are put into that category. So it's modal. And that is the case all over the world in every culture that's been looked at. And there have been quite a few by now. It's not so common among adults. And that's an interesting thing. But the basis, as I said, for security is the mother's prompt and appropriate response to the baby's signals and her lack of intrusiveness. Now, we're going to talk about two other categories that Ainsworth identified based on the baby's behavior in the strain situation. And I am not going to show you videos, partly because I don't have any that are um, suitable for general observation, but also because I don't want you to look at this and then think you can do this at home. So I can explain to you what avoidance is, but, um, and that is looking away and turning away and moving away from the parent when they return at reunion. However, um, you have to know a lot more about the, the, the range of avoidance that you can see in a baby, both in a strain situation and in other circumstances to decide if you would place that relationship in that category, understanding of course that we don't have categories, so to speak. Um, but it is simply looking away, turning away from the mother, moving away. So at, whereas Marcus went right for mom, as you remember, and was delighted to see her, um, an avoidant baby will look away, turn away, move away. This is associated with the mother's rebuffing of physical contact and also intrusiveness, kind of getting in the way of the baby. And it is common um, in about 20% of both child and adult attachment relationships. The third group that Ainsworth identified, we call ambivalent, she calls resistant. It's not so common, um, certainly not in the United States. Some cultures we see more of it, some less. And here we have a baby who explores very little and when his mother comes back, really greets her with distress and with anger even mild anger. And this comes, uh, or is certainly associated with the mother's inconsistent and delayed responsiveness. Mothers who are slow to respond, mothers who don't read the baby signals well, they're often very nice mothers, but they don't seem to understand the meaning of baby's attachment behavior. Now, in terms of these three categories, there's a great deal of continuity between uh, the time a baby might be seen in the strange situation and his or her behavior in later years, preschool and middle childhood. So with security, we continue to see harmonious interaction. It will deteriorate, however, with life stress and it will improve when life gets better so that these relationships, while generally stable, are not completely stable. And that's important to keep in mind. Uh, infant security is also a good predictor of cooperation with mother, um, competence in dealing with peers, better social cognition, and better emotion, emotional regulation, especially of negative emotions. All right, so we've talked about sensitivity, but what happens when the baby's haven of safety is also a source of alarm? That is, mother's behavior is alarming, scary, um, very upsetting. So that whereas the attachment system pushes the baby to get close to mother, the mother's behavior actually pushes the baby away. And when you think about it, what we see is due to that, that is attachment, their attachment behavior is hard to classify. 
because they have a strong um, extreme conflict about getting close to mom. And so we see a number of very odd behaviors that we won't go into detail about, but we see contradictory displays of behavior. We see odd behavior, behavior seemingly directed away from mother at the wall at somebody else. We see directly frightened behavior. And that does seem to be associated with the experience of being frightened by mother, which I wanna say is not necessarily because mother has been maltreating, but because the baby has actually been frightened with her. And so we do see directly frightened behavior, the clearest being the baby see, hearing the mother enter the room and dashing behind the furniture. We also see that behavior comes to a standstill. Babies can look like they're in a trance. They can look frozen. Uh, they can look lethargic. Sometimes they look depressed. So these are the kinds of things that are associated with what we now call a disorganized attachment relationship. And I'm not going to show you a film, but I am going to show you how our little crow does that. So remember where the crow was looking at the mother and baby. Now he looks away. I don't see you. That's plain old avoidance. Oh, where are my other ones? Now here, he's creeping close to the mother. And if you look carefully, you see he's all scrunched up. You can tell, certainly from the context, that he's nervous about her. He's frightened. His posture is beginning to look very odd. And we see this with babies as well. And do you remember when he got really close and he scrunched all the way down so you can barely see him? It does look like, don't look at me, you can hardly see me. But it's probably because he's experiencing a conflict between getting close to that baby duck and not being seen by mom and being frightened. Here are some drawings of other kinds of disorganized behavior that we see. Um, they're, they're of a kind, certainly the top and the second and the bottom are of a kind where the baby clearly looks alarmed, frightened, um, puts their hands to their mouth, we can think about what that means, but if you think about being frightened or surprised, you will think about how we naturally do that. But there's also a way in which they can hide their faces or hide their eyes. And that's what we see in the second from the bottom and the bottom child. Now, disorganized attachments are most prevalent in high risk and mental health samples. You can see in maltreatment samples, they can be as numerous as 80% of the mother baby attachments will be classified disorganized with mental illness or substance abuse populations of mothers and babies. We see between 40 and 80% just being poor increases the probability that we will see a disorganized attachment relationship and economic low risk is pretty much the what you would see in your typical comes to the laboratory and participates in a study kind of sample. Um, so what you can see from this list is that the stress on as stress on mothers increases the probability that the attachment relationship with their baby will be called disorganized increases. And, um, and that's an important thing to think about, um, that this is not necessarily terrible mothers, it's mothers under a great deal of stress. Um, it's good to know that disorganized attachment in infancy is linked to aggression um, at 24 months, aggression and externalizing behavior in the middle childhood years. But interestingly, by the time you look at older kids, when you compare, um, uh, when you look at what their classification of security attachment classification was, um, disorganized babies are more likely to describe themselves as experiencing dissociative symptoms. We also see higher levels of borderline personality disorder. 
So partly this is telling us that these are families under stress and subject to trauma. Um, but it also tells us something about how these relationships can uh, unfold over time. I want to stress that again, that mothers are frightening or alarming when they themselves feel helpless. So it's easy to be distressed when we um, think that a mother is abusing or neglecting her baby or her father. Um, but in fact, the mother's experience is often one of being helpless, um, out of control with the baby. And we see two types, two ways that mothers describe their babies. And if you have already begun to work with mothers and talk to them about their young children, you will have found aspects of this. One we call vilification, that's the little devil. The mother describes the child as out of control, getting really mad. She gets out of control, she gets enraged and the dyad becomes confrontational. But sometimes other mother-baby combinations or sometimes along with vilification, you'll see what we call glorification. The child is seen as a caregiver, as special and wonderful. The mother describes herself as merged with the child. They are two peas in a pod, a mother might say. The child knows exactly how I feel. This child is so sensitive. The mother might be deferential and she holds her anger back. Not that she doesn't feel it, but she holds anger towards the child back. And sometimes that means that she runs away from the child when there is conflict. And, and that puts the baby in a very different kind of conflict where they want to approach, but mother is always kind of running off. Anyway, I, I make a, a point of this because I think that the mothers of disorganized, disoriented children um, need and deserve a great deal of sympathy. And when you work with them, it's uh, really good to keep that in mind that they are in, in their way as stressed as the baby. Now, um, let us just sort of think of the range of relationships. People, um, maybe because Mary Maine and I call that last fourth group disorganized, that sounds really bad, doesn't it? And people began to think of disorganized attachment as in its, of itself, it's a terrible thing. But when you look at this figure, uh, what it represents, and really it's, um, it's stolen from a paper by Charlie Zena in New Orleans. Um, this is levels of attachment risk in young children. So with secure children, there's some risk, but not so much. With insecurity, it's a little more risk, but they're still overlapping with secure children. And here in terms of risk, we're talking about mental health and behavior risk at the time and in the future. Disorganized attachment, you see, is still overlapping with the insecure group. And it also, um, is an umbrella term for not only an insecure kind of relationship, but some of the ones kind of relationships you might see in the clinic or you might um, describe as having secure base distortions if you have read the work of Alicia Lieberman and Julie Paul. And young children and babies who are described as having reactive attachment disorder also tend to be classified in this group. So it's really a very broad group of risks. When you see it, uh, you should not think that this relationship is in extreme trouble, um, but rather that this is a relationship under stress. Now, um, I think I could slow down. I'm looking at the time here. I wanna talk about the concept of representation. This is another word that you've probably heard if you've had anything to do with um, reading or writing uh, clinical or research literature having to do with attachment. Uh, it's a very important concept. John Bowlby, right from the start, talked about people as having internal working models of attachment as if you have a little model in your brain that is constantly open to being updated. 
but that um, captures the relationship between yourself and an attachment figure. So it usually can be updated. And that is why we can see relationships change as the life of mother and baby and the life of the family improves or on the other hand, experience trauma. So that representation, um, when, when there's trauma, the representation you could say is not well updated. Why do we have these things, whatever they are in our heads? Well, it is how we, um, it helps us to perceive what's in front of us. Based on what we've experienced with our attachment figure, we will perceive that more likely in the mother's behavior in the future. It helps us to interpret what we're seeing. It helps us to, in essence, choose a feeling that we will have with respect to our caregiver. And it helps us plan, what am I gonna do? Mom's going to work, okay. Uh, how do I keep her from going to work? <laughs> how am I gonna know how to get in touch with her? Based on the security or the quality of that attachment relationship, your plans will be very different. If mom does not mind, as it were, you calling her at work, you might call her at work. If mom does not accept that kind of behavior and wants you to be a big boy or girl, you will not call her at work and you will have to come up with another strategy. So again, the representation in your mind you have of the relationship will have a big effect on your behavior. The, what's interesting about this, although it can be updated, it also, we also use it to affect how we perceive things. So if a baby perceives a mother as discouraging close contact, for example, um, his behavior will, will be avoidant. That is, he or she will stay far away from the mother. And then the mother will perceive the baby as not needing her. So these perceptions actually maintain a kind of stability in the relationship. Even though new information can come in, there is this quality of what happened before determining how mother and baby act with one another. And that can keep the interaction between them relatively stable or unchanging. What are representations? Uh, I hope you can see this slide pretty clearly. Um, because various people have had various ways of identifying what representations are. They're called schemas. People talk about them as um, uh, rules, theorems, assumptions. But I think that you will get the best sense of what a representation is by doing this little exercise that Everett Waters and, uh, his, and Harriet Waters invented for research purposes a number of years ago. If you look at all these words and think to yourself of a story, a little story that you would tell somebody making use of all these words. So take a moment and see if you can make a story for yourself. You might even want to write it down for a second. Well, I hope you have come up with a story using most or all of those words. Now, um, I'm going to show you the kind of story a parent of a secure child would tell in this next slide. And I think I better read it to you because it's not in beautiful focus. A mother and baby were playing one morning. Mother would hide under a blanket and then jump out and the baby would smile and hug her and then do the same thing. Then they read a story. And then the baby wanted to play with his teddy bear, but it was lost and he got upset. But mother found it and said, here it is, he's okay. And the baby was happy and they played some more and then the baby took a nap. Now, I don't know if the little story you told yourselves has this form, but you will notice that we have here positive interaction as we would expect 
uh, with a generally secure relationship. But what's important here is that something goes wrong. In this case, the teddy bear is lost. Something goes wrong, the baby is upset, but the mother solves the problem. And then the baby is okay again. If you think about it, this is kind of what happens in uh, the strange situation with a secure baby, a little boy like Marcus that we just looked at. He's fine, mom goes away, uh-oh, uh-oh, now he's in trouble, she comes back. We see these stories with this, what I call theme of danger and then rescue. When mothers tell stories, when they take this assessment, when children uh, tell stories about the relationship with mother, um, and you can detect it uh, actually in the greatest literature usually has this format as well, danger and rescue. So um, if you went through this exercise and made up the story, I think what you can see is that you were not reading a model. You were not reading a picture or a particular representation in your mind. If you came up with a story with this kind of structure, danger and rescue, it, um, you invented it, you constructed it in the moment. Um, and this is important to consider because when we tr try to talk to people and get a feel for their um, representation of their relationship with their baby now or their relationship with their parents in the past, they are going through that same process as you just went through, through quickly in trying to come up with a narrative. And if you reflect for a moment, you just created that story from the processing of your brain, from your mind. It was partly cognitive, it was partly affective. I don't know what part of the brain did it, but I think you will see that you made it up on the minute, on the moment. And that is what happens with our representations of our relationships. Um, and this, when you're a clinician, is in a way what you are trying to influence. You're trying to help people uh, update their uh, representations of attachment or their representations of their babies uh, in a way that will promote sensitive caregiving. Um, now, the most famous research assessments of representation uh, most famous one is the adult attachment interview called the AAI, and this was invented by Carol George, my great peer and colleague, and Mary Main and Ruth Goldwyn. Uh, and that is a semi-structured inter interview. It's kind of a semi-clinical interview. And the job, when you go back over it and try to decide what the parent's representation of, adult, of, a, of their past attachment relationships, their own attachment relationships. You're trying to see, well, what is it they say they remember? But more important, can they construct a coherent life story about their relationships with their parents? Because it doesn't matter, you don't necessarily find that parents tell you that their childhood with their mothers and fathers was just swell. <laughs> In fact, if anything, they tell you a much more complicated story quite naturally and spontaneously about what was great and what was not so great. Again, just as you made up that secure base story, they are making up their answers to your questions. And, um, and, and generally they are being quite honest. Um, they can't, people can't help being honest, um, but whatever they tell you, their representations are not necessarily true. So if they uh, told you that their mother was, for example, warm and affectionate, you may or may not believe them. And you would then have to look for further evidence throughout the, the interview to see, was this mother really warm and affectionate? Hmm, then why do I have this story about how you came home every day from school and your mother was always on the phone and you never knew when she would get off, right? So that's a little incoherent, a story. Um, and so that's what, again, what we look for is for people to tell us uh, a story that makes sense, that fits together 
even if that relationship was very troubled, we want the story to make sense that they don't feel a need to hide from themselves or from the interviewers what was their experience. Uh, so there are four groups uh, when the AAI is classified. Um, and think about it for a minute, they parallel, I think, what we talked about um, with the strange situation, A, B, C, D classifications. The secure adult is free to explore, to talk about, to think about past relationships and things that happened. They sometimes in the moment of an interview will come up with an insight that they say, oh, I never thought about this before, but such and such and such and such happened. In the same way as a baby is free to explore the playroom and free to move around the, mo around the room to come to mom and to move away from mom, as you saw Marcus do, uh, that's what the interviews of secure adults seem like. And we have next the dismissing group, which is meant to be equivalent to the baby avoidant group. And here they make little of the past. Oh, it was fine. Sometimes they ideal, oh, it was fine. Nothing, nothing went wrong, it was normal. Or sometimes they say something much more negative about their relationships. But in a way parallel to our babies who are avoidant, they turn away and look away from that relationship and instead focus on other things of interest to them in the course of answering questions in this interview. The third group enmeshed is parallel in general, sort of closely to the resistant or ambivalent category. That is, they're still mad at their parents. They have not forgotten the, the various um, slings and arrows of their childhood with their parent and still they may still have a very high conflict relationship with the parent. Um, and so again, we see a parallel between how the mother thinks about or describes her own experience and what we see between her and the baby. And the last group is called unresolved. And this uh, is a sort of a special group, but it is um, uh, parallel, it overlaps if not completely, quite a bit with uh, disorganized infant baby or child infant mother or child mother relationships. And these are people who, when they talk about past abuse or loss, which of course many people have had some experience of, their thinking begins to unravel in a way it sometimes has dissociative qualities. Their voice might change and actually get kind of ghostly or witchy, or they might focus on certain specific details as if it just happened yesterday. Uh, these kinds of qualities, which of course you have to be trained to identify, tell us something about the, the organization of that parents or the disorganization of that parents thinking about past relationships because their thinking kind of comes apart. So these are the four groups. And um, going back to what Freud said about the mother-baby relationship being the model for all relationships to come, we certainly would expect a good match between um, these classifications of the adult attachment interview um, and, um, sorry, I'm just looking at the time. Um, these classifications and what we see with, baby, with their babies. And the general finding is, well, sort of, yes. <laughs> there is a link between the mother's and the child's attachment classification. The child's are uh, often based on the child's behavior, but there are also other measures for babies and children. So if the mother is classified secure, it's very likely that her baby or child will also, that their behavior in the strange situation will also be classified secure. And that's generally true for the avoidant groups too. 
the link between the mother's representation of her past and the baby's behavior um, for resistant and disorganized groups is weaker. Um, and so I'm making a big deal about this um, because as clinicians, we're all very influenced, uh, whether you're a clinician or a social worker, or even a teacher, we're very influenced by Freud's statement. And uh, yes, he was right and he was not so right. Um, we can wonder why is there a good relationship between mother and baby, um, their attachment classification? Um, why is that so for secure parents, but not so true for avoidant and really not true for resistant and disorganized? And I don't know if we'll have time to talk about it, but maybe we will. Um, and um, again, when you're working with parents and young children, it's worth thinking both about the ways that they may be similar, but also the ways that they may be different. Another relevant piece of information is what is the stability in, uh, for a particular child between how they were classified in their attachment to mother, for example, um, in the strange situation or some other assessment and how they are classified when they do the adult attachment interview. Um, what we find is that there is a lot of stability between infancy and young adulthood, but especially for secure classifications. So there's not so much stability for the insecure ones. And that is really worth thinking about. Now, secure relationships do tend to be stable over, you know, if you meet them at uh, age 12 or 14 months, and then you meet them again when they're, ni when they're 19 or 25, you may find uh, a lot of uh, continuity or similarities between infant and adult classifications for the secure ones. But that will not be true um, if there have been major traumatic or very difficult events in the life of the family. So when there has been abuse, when a parent has died, when there have been some other really terrible kinds of events, you can understand how the relationship might now in one way or another deteriorate and move from secure to insecure. And in some cases, you know, when there's been a wonderful infant parent psychotherapist, perhaps, the relationship moves from insecure to secure. Um, that last point on the slide, the U, which stands for unresolved classifications in infancy, very often transform into an organized ABC kind of relationship. So there, if, so, if a baby was um, classified as disorganized uh, in infancy or early childhood, when you come back and assess them uh, through, you know, interview them about their relationships, they may seem to be either secure, avoidant, or ambivalent. And at least in some samples, they are most likely to become avoidant, which is interesting to think of too. So they find ways to shut off or close down uh, what are perhaps very difficult memories but in a way that may be pretty functional. That is, they, it seems to be organized and coherent, even if it's not secure. Uh, this is just a little picture of data, um, my data from a study uh, looking at mothers uh, that's across the top, the AAI, the mother's classification, and along the side, that is the classification of the child's attachment relationship to the mother. And uh, the child assessment was done when the children were in kindergarten. Um, what you see, again, is what I said before. If you look between secure, which is called group B, and the mother group that's equivalent, you see that there's a very strong correspondence. Although one mother seemed unresolved and yet her child was secure. We got really good correspondence between avoidant babies and the dismissing category for mothers. 
And then when you move down to the ambivalent groups, uh, many of them are enmeshed, but some of the mothers seem to be dismissing. Or you could turn it around and say some mothers who seem very dismissing of attachment have ambivalent and angry babies. And then when we get to children who are classified as disorganized, um, what we see is that some of them had mothers who were unresolved about abuse or loss, but not all of them. And that raises the interesting question then, what is disorganizing that mother-baby relationship? Um, and of course, we're not gonna answer that right now. Uh, if we have time, we can talk about these things later. Um, but um, that's what I wanna say about the data. We've already talked about that slide. I wanna talk about some everyday implications of, um, of this basic attachment information we've been talking about. Common implications. You know this happens, the babies become demanding when they're sick. Mothers say, gosh, I can't get him off me. Well, that's the attachment system working. Remember that feeling vulnerable activates or turns on attachment behavior. And sometimes it helps mothers when you can talk to them about it in this way. This is, this is just, um, this, is, this is the system working well. They feel vulnerable and they wanna be sure they're with their attachment figure because you know if they were a baby monkey and they were feeling the way they are, they might get captured by a tiger. Um, sleep problems, fears about monsters in the bedroom. Um, commonly occur when children are old enough to know a little bit about the world. Um, they have imaginary fears, but we have learned actually that it's helpful if mothers take those fears as seriously as they can and don't just poo-poo them and say, no, there's no, there's no monster in your bedroom, never mind, or that's just a shadow. That doesn't help. The children actually need the mother to look under the bed and assure the child that there is no monster. And that is equivalent to the parent literally protecting them from um, danger. Here's a common one. You're on the phone or your client is on the phone um, at, and the toddler cannot leave you alone, constantly interrupts you. Now, again, this is not such a great thing. But what's happening is that the mother is clearly not paying attention to them. Her availability has gone down once she's on the phone. And so the baby's attachment figure or the toddler's attachment, attachment, sorry, attachment behavior increases. To, do you see me? You see what I just did? Wait, I need you to look at this. I need this, I need that. Again, that's just the natural functioning of the attachment system in our modern world. On the positive side, um, it's good to know that a familiar place or just the presence of the caregiver reduces distress during a separation. And this we all know to be the case. But it also works if the parent has to go away and the caregiver is familiar, then the child is going to be less distressed. Again, we know this, but, um, but we can see that the child, it works not because the child might be attached to this new caregiver, but because the situation is not so scary. And so they don't show so much attachment behavior and presumably they're not as distressed uh, if they know the caregiver than if they did not know the caregiver. Um, that's why people like to invite family in or have known people care for their children when the parents go to work or if the parents have to leave town for a few minutes, having a familiar person or grandma there um, really helps the baby or young child um, feel calmer in the absence of their attachment figure. And of course, the attachment figure feels calmer too. And that has to do with the caregiving system, which we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. Here is another very common observation. Separation, even from a maltreating parent, is very distressing. In fact, it can be traumatic. And those of you who are social workers or work with children who have been um, separated from their parents, um, 
for any number of reasons, know that the separation is extremely painful for the child and can actually, is actually like a trauma. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes. But um, why do they, why is this so distressing? Why can they not be separated from what might be a very, very inadequate parent? Well, it's like the disorganized behavior we see in the strange situation. The, par the same parent who, who they're attached to might also be extremely frightening. And that combination puts the child in a kind of conflict that they themselves cannot resolve. So that's an explanation for that. Um, well, we'll talk about this in a minute, I hope, when we talk about major separations. But um, when there is, um, when there have been many place and placements, when children are deprived of a stable caregiver, we see some very um, unfortunate behavior. Uh, and sometimes it can be very hard to, um, to move the child towards something more adequate. We'll talk about detachment. Um, what this refers to is acting as if they couldn't care less about their caregiver. Or on the other hand, being hypervigilant, not letting the caregiver move from them from an inch. And you can see how um, being deprived of any caregiver or having been moved from placement to placement can lead to this kind of behavior. And it is really something that we have to think about when we are making placement decisions. I'm sure many social workers already do grapple with this. Um, it is uh, one of the more negative results of what sometimes happens, uh, and we want to avoid those results the best we have can. Um, so now I'm going to talk very quickly, and I do think we're going to have time for questions, um, about some of the common, um, sort of the classic research on what happens when children are separated from their parents. And I would bet that many of you who are listening to this talk have been thinking about this when you, um, when you think about the children who were removed from their mothers at the border um, within the last year or so. Um, of course, a lot depends on who is caring for them and also my spelling could be improved. Um, but this, people have been looking at children in sort of classic orphanages for a very long time. And this is one of the things that um, also influenced Bowlby and influenced other people of his time to look into uh, how the mother-baby relationship functions. Um, what happens when you see children who have been raised in orphanages where there is no stable caregiver for them, uh, you see two kinds of results. You see that some children are very inhibited. They fail to respond to social initiatives. They're very inhibited in their social related, relatedness. They're very frightened all the time. If you think about it, no wonder they're frightened. If they don't have an attachment figure, how do they ever feel safe in the orphanage? How do they ever, um, they never feel safe. They're always, feeling unprotected, um, even in their familiar orphanage, without someone, without an attachment figure to help them navigate even the limited experiences they're having in the orphanage. So that's one kind of result. The other kind of result is, um, it can have various names. It can be called indiscriminate sociability, uh, shallow relationships with adults and peers. And these are children who, can, who are not inhibited and do move towards others, uh, move towards strange people, but they don't actually seem to differentiate very strongly between someone that they're familiar with and someone they're not familiar with. So again, those of you who are in the social work world may have seen children like this who are overly friendly, seem to have no boundaries. And while they're very positive, you learn quickly that they're that way to everyone, nothing special about you. 
So it's as though they have, um, they only have very shallow kinds of relationships with potential caregivers. When people first saw children in these orphanages in the 30s and 40s of the last century, and uh, there are still some now, um, most famous ones, uh, I think there are a few left in Romania. Um, you know, people have wondered, how do you describe what's going on in terms of our uh, strange situation classifications? You will not be surprised to hear um, that when babies who have been in an orphanage um, are observed in the strange situation with someone, presumably their familiar caregiver from the orphanage, what is observed are a lot of disorganized attachments but even more atypical attachments. Um, you don't see easily classified attachments between children and even these familiar caregivers. Um, it's as though they really have not, of course not, they haven't organized their attachment behavior around a particular figure. No wonder their behavior seems disorganized and disoriented. Um, interestingly though, uh, indiscriminate sociability, going up to people and having really poor boundaries is independent of their attachment security or their attachment organization. So um, this quality of, of having poor boundaries to be colloquial um, seems to be a piece of this growing up in an orphanage or having many, many caregivers and no stable caregivers. And so um, I know that I have observed it, maybe some of you have observed it in um, children living in families and homes, but where there's a great deal of neglect. You also see this over-friendly lack of boundary kind of behavior. Um, interestingly, children who, um, Charlie Zena, you've heard that name already, uh, and some other people did careful studies where they took children who were in orphanages in Romania and placed them in community families, average, fine, no, nothing special. Um, when you do that, uh, especially if you do it when the child is less than 24 months of age, uh, the child seems to do fine and they seem secure in their new relationships. Things get a little complicated when the child is placed after 24 months in a new home. But even those children who are secure um, may show indiscriminate sociability. And that behavior can last for quite a long time. Um, uh, this slide uh, was made at a time that the study only went through four years of age. So some of the children who were adopted or placed in foster homes um, and had um, secure or otherwise organized relationships like the avoidant and the resistant relationships. Even so, you saw indiscriminate sociability. So there's an interesting puzzle about what makes that behavior. And yet, uh, we, I don't think that anybody feels like this is a good thing to see in a young child. We don't quite know why not, but it seems like it must be worrisome. Uh, I am going to go over this and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we see when children have simply a major, what's called a major separation from the caregiver. Um, and these would be children, for example, who are um, taken out of the home and then later are returned to the home. This could be for, um, I think usually we define a major separation as two weeks or more. Um, so sometimes children might be in foster care for a shorter period of time, or babies might be in foster care for a short period of time, um, relatively short. Or sometimes children, as you know, are placed out of the home for a longer period of time, and then we want to see them when they get back with their parents. And this is where we see, again, very problematic behavior. We can see what's called detachment, which I've already talked about and which actually seems to be like a state of dissociation. It's not just what uh, our avoidant babies do in the strange situation. It's a much deeper um, dazed kind of state. On the other hand, you also see clinging and hypervigilance and sleep problems. Those children are likely to be 
fearful to say the least, if not hysterical, if they see a reminder of the separation. So once they're back in their home, um, they may seem very distressed. Uh, you might see out of context anger, that is the child seems to be fine and all of a sudden they are just furious and you don't even know why. That is common when children have had one or repeated major separations. Um, and the interesting thing is uh, that this behavior is often directed more towards the primary attachment figure than a secondary one. And I was just uh, working with a mother and father who share the care of their little child. And the mother is the one who gets hit. The mother is the one who gets the bad behavior, but, fa but father does not get much of that. And um, there is a way in which babies seem to hold things against their mothers more than against their fathers. Um, there have also been studies of how daycare affects children, right? So if a big separation affects them and affects their attachment behavior, how does a short one, but repeat it every day in daycare? And many people, when, when daycare became prevalent, I guess that was maybe in the 70s or, late 70s, 80s, it became much more common for mothers to work and go to and use daycare for their babies. People were very alarmed and thought that we would have um, a world of insecure babies. Um, so there were a number of studies and the most famous one is the National Institute of Child Health and Development study, NICHD, big study, a thousand children, very careful assessment. And what they discovered is contrary to what many people predicted, the amount of daycare experience a child has and the quality of their daycare experience, this is kind of interesting, was not related to either their separation distress or their attachment security with their parents. So um, that was a big surprise when that study came out. However, if the child's mother is very low in sensitivity and the daycare is low in quality and the child is in a long time in daycare, then it does seem to reduce the child's security with the parent. So it's interesting to think how much you have to stress the child um, before um, their security with their attachment figure um, seems to be affected. Another study by me and Carol George, uh, also again, looking at repeated but short separations, uh, which are part of mo modern life. We looked at families who were separating and divorced or divorcing and had toddlers between 12 and 18 months. Again, many people were predicting that with overnight visitation um, of a night or two or three away, from, you know, going between the parents, so leaving usually the mother and going to the father and returning to the mother. Uh, people expected that that alone would um, lead to insecure attachment. But in fact, it doesn't seem to be the case. However, for families where there is high conflict and the parents don't talk to one another, and that's sadly very common in a situation where parents are separating and have babies or toddlers. In that situation, relationships were often disorganized or couldn't be classified. So um, again, not the separation alone, but the separation in very poor circumstances, appalling circumstances, did seem to re result in insecure attachment. And interesting, mothers who were confident in themselves as mothers, they were confident about their ability to provide protection to the child, were less likely to have children who were disorganized or unclassifiable, even where there was quite a bit of um, long overnight visits away from mother. Um, and so this is what uh, I think is the truism that I recommend that you keep in mind when you think of the effects of repeated separations. Um, and that is, rather than worry about the separation in and of itself, think about the context. So negative effects of separation are reduced or maybe prevented altogether. We're not sure if there is a stable, sensitive, alternate caregiver 
that, that, that takes care of the child during the separation, and if there are other factors in the environment that reduce the child's fear. Um, it is the conditions of separation, and then what happens on reunion, how the parent is able to um, uh, welcome the child back home, um, that will determine whether the ill effects of separation are evident or not. And that is my last slide. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, we can take questions if there are any. There are. First of all, I want to thank you, Judith. And I want to remind everybody to please fill out the feedback evaluation. It'll be in the chat box. And if you click on the link, you can fill it out. And we very much value your feedback. So I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Susan Chinitz, who's the cl clinical co-director of TTAC, to um, raise questions. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Judith. That was a really fantastic review of <laughs> attachment theories. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, I think, Judith, that this question um, was in regard to your mentioning the daycare studies. Mm -hmm. um, the question was, how was maternal sensitivity defined in that study? It was defined in ways very similar to how uh, Mary Ainsworth defined sensitivity in her original studies in the home. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, which is if you go back to that earlier slide, uh, looking at how promptly and appropriately the mother responded to the child's attachment signals, how accepting and cooperative the mother was with the child. Um, that's pretty much how they measured it in the home. And then people often, you know, set mother and child a task to do together and rate those same things. So that's how it was done. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question. You mentioned that there are more childhood secure attachments than adult. Yeah, I Why did. do adults seem to lose this status? Um, I'm sorry the person's there. We could have a conversation about it. Um, I think there are many events that can get between, um, can, can get there between, get in the way of mothers or fathers and their children over the course of development. Um, babies are very cute. Uh, they're, they're not, and sometimes they're not so hard to take care of. But life happens and children become difficult and other things influence their development. Uh, they may have bad school experiences. They may get in with a gang. Any number of things can happen. And the relation, and they may be serious enough uh, that the relationship doesn't come back to a harmonious equilibrium. Also, when parents are very ill, they can no longer, sometimes they can't muster the strength or attention to be sensitive to their child any longer. Um, so I think the decrease in security reflects um, that life is hard um, and that relationships can actually be injured and not recovered. But I also want to point out that there are plenty of adults who are classified secure based on the adult attachment interview. And from what they say, they did not have some kind of easy, wonderful childhood either. They had many difficult events. They might have experienced abuse and loss and death and sickness in, among the parents. And still, they remain coherent. Um, uh, and clear about what happened to them and able to reflect on events. And therefore, they are judged secure. Um, and the work might have been done within their own minds by themselves, or sometimes comes from therapy, or sometimes because they have been loved by someone else who is supportive and wonderful. And the child has been able to organize their thinking about relationships around this other person. That's my answer. Thank you, <laughs> very interesting. Um, okay, we have a lot of questions. Um, I treat <laughs> twins, I treat, <laughs> yep. I treat twins over five years old now who are in an art, who in an art therapy session drew themselves back in their mother's stomach. Can this be an attachment issue or related to COVID, the COVID pandemic? 
Oh, I think, I think that interpreting children's symbolic behavior in the context of um, art therapy or clinical relationship is much more complicated. Um, and I haven't really talked about, we do have assessments of children's representation of attachment, um, but we do them in a standardized situation. So when you get an actual child in an actual class or clinical situation, you have to really get to know that child and get into uh, the, the meaning of their play along with them. So I wouldn't say for better or worse, if I'm worried or delighted about this child's picturing themselves back in their mom's tummy, um, I, I wouldn't go that far. I would really want to know that child and work with that child. Thank you. Um, when you were going over the various attachment types, it occurred to me that there may be children that present with more than one type. Is that possible? Um, well, usually then they would be placed with the disorganized group. They might be called unclassifiable. Um, and usually there are very few of them. And so they're, you know, the way you do in research, you combine them with the other high risk group. Um, there have been some studies, Doug has done some studies looking at children whose mothers are very depressed and he, uh, children meaning in, in five or six or preschool age, um, and they sometimes with a depressed mother, you might see this kind of mixture of things. So yes, it's possible. Um, I, I guess I should point out here that remember these groups, uh, we, we tend to make artificial demarcations of categories. And so it has to be expected that we will see some combinations that are not common. Um, and, and that's why you study really hard <laughs> to learn mm -hmm. to find and know what you to know what you want to do with them and, and continue to do research with them as well. Okay, does the close birth of another baby or large families affect the firstborns or others? In terms of their attachment relationship to the, to the mother, uh, there have not been a lot of sibling studies. Um, the, I think the most common finding is that um, the, the study that I remember best, and I'm, maybe if the name of I think it Lawrence Aber might have been one of the researchers and he I think is in New York um, at uh, Columbia or Hunter. Yeah. I know him, right Susan? I think that he did a study but I might have just been, he might have just given me a paper, someone else's paper about the study, which showed that if a mother, if, a, if the first child was secure with the mother, uh, they would stay secure. But that doesn't mean there wouldn't be a short-term short problem. And maybe you would see that depending on when you captured it. But generally, um, if the child was secure, they stay secure. And the second child will, is also likely to be secure. However, what's I think interesting is that if you have a, a mother and child where there's an insecure attachment, and then there's a second child born, the second child um, um, will, you can't predict whether that second child will be secure or insecure with the parent. So how do I understand that? I understand that as mothers who have by luck of their, their, their own childhood experiences or subsequent experiences, mother, mothers who can provide sensitive care to one child will provide it to another. Mothers, but otherwise mothers who cannot do it, they may be more influenced by the child and by the amount of stress in their lives um, than mothers who have already achieved some kind of state of balance in their minds. So that's the best I can give you. I, there's probably more of a literature, but I don't think I know it. Um, and I expect that first children do go through difficulties. I mean, I know they go through difficulties. Every mother will say their firstborn went through difficulties, um, but they're not necessarily permanent. 
Thank you, Judith. This is um, in relation to the work you, that to Charlie Zena's work that you were describing. Um, the participant said, I'm familiar with Zena's work, but the thought occurs to me that indiscriminate sociability may have a benefit when there are multiple caregivers. I know it's often looked at as a negative, but there are also some evolutionary benefits to having this. And I'm sorry, that wasn't really a question. It was a comment. Well, I would agree with that observation. I think that there, in fact, all of the insecure, when we have a stable type of the avoidant or ambivalent type, those are also available to children as a product of evolution. And they do have their adaptive qualities, no question. If you have a mother with 12 children who has to go out to a job and does not have time to be sensitive and wonderful, then it's good if you don't ask so much of them, right? It's good, it's a good thing. And mothers often go out of their way to encourage that kind of early independence. And depending on mother's circumstances and depending on the culture and everything else, there are certainly advantages. And the fact that young children can come up with more or less coherent alternate strategies tells us that there is some evolutionary basis for that. And I think the same thing happens when the way children do um, latch on to many pe people when they don't have their own caregiving, caregiver. Sorry, I'm just getting tired. Um, yeah, of course it's advantageous. But I think all of these alternate kind of strategies have a cost. Um, so um, that's, that's how it is. What is adaptive um, for a young child with multiple caregivers may create a problem when, if they live in a culture in which they're expected to be a monogamous spouse. I'm just, I'm making this up. I'm not saying that this is what happens. But I think that, um, yeah, you have being shallow in your affections can be very adaptive. Uh, but it's not necessarily what we would wish for our children. Okay, um, I think we have time for one more. Um, as we are discussing the attachment continuum, are we assuming that there's an absence of mental health diagnoses from the caregivers? I guess the question is related to um, you know, where does maternal mental health fit into to this? Oh, um, I did show you that, that one chart. With a serious mental illness of mothers, the chance that they will be alarming <laughs> to their children or frightening to their children increases. And we do see more disorganized or atypical relationships. But it's not a given. There are a number, there are many mothers who are very depressed and yet somehow manage to give their best to their young child. And you might not see the mother's problem reflected in the mother-child relationship. Um, I think that, um, I think the data suggests that when uh, a mother has one major depressive episode, uh, say in the first 12 months of life or first two years, um, their relationship with their child is not necessarily disorganized. But where mother ha mothers have chronic and repeated, repeated bouts of depression, um, there, there can be more of an effect on the mother-baby relationship. So that's just an example with depression. Um, bipolar disorder, I don't think I mentioned it in particular, but is associated with very high levels of disorganized attachment. And if you know so Judith, I just want to thank you so much for such an informative and rich webinar. And I hope that everybody will plan to join us for part two with uh, Arietta Slade, the Relational Foundation of Reflective Practice and Reflective Parenting on December 4th. You can register on our website. So thank you, Susan. And thank you, Judith. This was really incredibly rich. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, are we off? People are just signing off, so. Okay, wait. <laughs>